Good morning and welcome to this press briefing on the UN Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2017, which looks at some of the most pressing issues such as the globalization backlash, rising inequality and environmental degradation from a governance and policy perspective. With us here today are Sebastian Vergara, Economic Affairs Officer of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and Pauline Ng, uh, Associate Economic Affairs Officer, also from the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Um, I'm going to start with Sebastian. Yes. Thank you very much, Dan. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the launch of the the Economic and Social Survey for, for Asia and the Pacific. Um, this report was prepared by the Economic and Social Commission uh, for Asia and the Pacific, and it's a great pleasure for both of us, for Pauline and myself, to launch the report here in New York today on their behalf, on the behalf of the ESCAP Commission. Uh, let me start by highlighting that this is a very relevant and very interesting re report that uses not only a development but also a macroeconomic perspective in order to analyze the recent trends and the recent changes in the economic and social trends uh, in the, the region. In, in terms of content, in the first part, the report analyzes uh, and discusses the economic outlook for the region and what are the key risks and the key uh, challenges that the region is facing today. Then, in the second part, the report discusses the role of governance and fiscal management in particular uh, in the current development situation of Asia and the Pacific. Let me emphasize straight away what are the key messages of the report. The first message is that the economic outlook for the region is moderately positive, uh, but at the same time, the reports mention that there are downside risks. These risks relate mainly to the policy uncertainties that we observe in the global economy. As a result of this, countries in the region should strengthen the domestic and regional drivers of growth. The second message of the report is that there is a critical role for governance in supporting an, um, an effective fiscal management. This is important in order to lift long-term economic prospect, in order to improve the quality and not only the level of growth, and also to address uh, the social and environmental challenges that the region is facing today. And then the third message is that there is a need for improving the transparency and the accountability in public administration. These are key aspects in order to strengthen the quality of governance and fiscal management. In terms of the outlook, um, the economic growth is expected to remain relatively robust in the region. In particular, GDP growth in developing countries in the region is expected to slightly increase from 4.9% in 2016 to 5% in 2017 and 5.1% in 2018. Uh, of course, there is a lot of heterogeneity in the region, but the report uh, highlights, for example, some sub-regions like South Asia and the East Asia that will continue to perform in a robust uh, pace. A case in point is the case of China and India. Uh, in recent years, uh, growth has been driven mainly by private consumption, which has been uh, supported by low inflation in the region and also by a supportive monetary policy stance. Uh, having said that, the report also highlights and emphasizes that from a more medium-term perspective, the economic growth in the region is slower of what was observed uh, in the last 15 years. So this highlights 
two main headwinds uh, in the region. The first headwind is that there is a weak performance of private investment uh, and is not expected to rebound in the near term. There are many reasons uh, for this. Uh, on the external side, uh, there is a still weak global demand and also uh, some policy uncertainties that are affecting the performance of investment. And also on the domestic front, we observe that there is low capacity utilization and some balance sheet uh, problems in the banking and in the corporate sector in some economies. The second headwind is that, is that there is a weak performance of trade and export in particular. In recent months, we have observed that in some economies, uh, the export performance has improved, but uh, this remained largely subdued and well below what we observed some years back. Uh, and the risk is that new protectionist measures can affect this performance even further. Why this is important? This is important because an environment characterized by subdued investment and subdued trade can affect uh, productivity growth, which is very relevant in order to promote the medium-term growth and sustain increases in wages. In terms of the policy challenges, uh, the report recognizes that the monetary policy space is narrowing, inflation is picking up in some economies, and also we observe that there, are, that there is a tightening of global financial conditions. But having said that, the report also shows that there is a key role for a proactive fiscal policy, in particular in order to stabilize economic activity, to promote a crowding in in private investment, and to support development priorities. And finally, the report also highlights structural reforms in the region that should uh, complement uh, the fiscal policy. Uh, however, it, it is very important that these structural reforms need to take into account the environmental and the distributional effect that this structural reforms may have. In order to implement and to effectively um, implement these policy challenges and these policies, uh, the report discusses the governance and fiscal management. So I will give now the floor to Pauline that will present us the key points in this, in this topic. Thank you, Sebastian. Good morning, everyone. So in the next part of our presentation, I will be highlighting some of the key messages in the thematic chapter of this report, which explores the issue of strengthening governance and the management of fiscal policy in the Asia-Pacific region. Here is a snapshot of how the quality of governance has evolved in a few major regions across the world. For the developing countries in the Asia-Pacific, we have seen a slight increase in the quality of governance over the past two decades. However, as you can see, the level still lags far behind the developed world, and this indicates that there's still a significant room for improvement for the region. Another important point to highlight is that within the region, there are large differences in the quality of governance between countries. And while governance has improved in the East and Northeast Asia, it has deteriorated in the region's small island developing states and its least developed countries. Now, these trends are a cause for concern for the Asia-Pacific region, given that poor governance and weak institutions adversely affects a country's development prospects, such as through the worsening of income inequality, as well as a slower poverty reduction. With this in mind, uh, therefore, there is a, an urgent need for Asia-Pacific countries to strengthen governance, especially in the area of fiscal policy. Improved governance can strengthen fiscal management from both the revenue and expenditure sides. If you see from the chart, um, on the left-hand side, from the revenue perspective, the report finds that countries in the region with stronger governance 
tend to collect higher tax revenues. And this enhances the country's fiscal space and increases the availability, availability of resources for the government to progress on its development objectives. On the expenditure side, stronger fiscal governance increases the amount of public resources allocated for development. In the Asia-Pacific, the report finds that uh, countries with lower corruption tend to spend less on defence and more on health. The report also shows that uh, for countries in the region, better governance increases the positive impact of public spending, particularly in the education and health sectors. So the next question that arises is uh, what can be done to improve fiscal governance in the Asia Pacific such that uh, a country's resources can be effectively channeled towards improving the quality of growth. Now the report calls for countries in the region to increase transparency and accountability in the public sector and this can be achieved through three main areas. First, is improving public access to fiscal data and information, such as uh, financial disclosure requirements for government officials. Second, is through increasing the usage of ICT and electronic systems in the government. And third, is through better monitoring of policy implementation, for example, by introducing feedback from citizens on the quality of public services in the country. And I would encourage everyone to read the full report as uh, it contains more details on the policies as well as country-specific examples. We have come to the final slide of our presentation. Just to wrap up, here are four key takeaways. First, uh, while Asia-Pacific's growth prospects remain favourable, the region is facing increasing risks from high global uncertainty and rising trade protectionism. Second, therefore, in this environment, countries need to focus on improving the quality of growth. And this includes tackling rising income inequality, high poverty and environmental issues. Third, fiscal policy can play a more proactive role in sustaining Asia-Pacific's growth prospects. And finally, stronger governance, in particular improved fiscal management, is critical in order for the region to achieve better development outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, we'll take questions. Yes. Thank you, Ariana King from Japanese newspaper Nikkei. Uh, I have a question regarding a very specific case. Uh, the DPRK, as you know, has been a major topic of concern both in the UN Security Council. Uh, it's been sanctioned, and uh, as an issue of regional security. Um, is there anything you can say about how, uh, you know, heightened tension? You did mention uh, region or uncertainty is causing issues. How can you uh, describe the uh, issues that are coming from, uh, you know, security, investment, the uh, dispatching, uh, dispatching of THAAD missile system? Can you say anything about the effect that DBRK is having on the region and spending? <clears throat> Well, the security issues uh, are always important and the political consideration as well, but the, the specificity of that question really goes a little bit beyond uh, of what the report uh, discusses and analyzes. So uh, in that regard, we are not in um, a position to uh, discuss that, that issue in detail. Um, however, if, if, if you agree, I can, we can put you in contact with our colleagues in SCAP Commission uh, uh, if you want to, uh, to have a more comprehensive answer for that, uh, for that question. Yes. Shi uh, Xiaomeng with Xinhua News Agency, China. Uh, I have one question with the Belt and Road Initiative, because you just mentioned that the uh, the economic outlook for the region is generally uh, positive, but still uh, facing risks and the need uh, regional drivers. So I want to ask that what kind of benefits do you think that this initiative can bring to the region? And um, 
Also, I want to ask what suggestions do you have for China as well as countries that are participating in the initiative to manage the quality governance when implementing the initiative? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, with regards to the China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I think the report does mention part of it as uh, it is indeed very beneficial to the region uh, through increasing intra-regional trade as well as intra-regional investment activity. Uh, how we see it is that um, greater trade and investment between um, different countries will definitely um, mobilize more resources, uh, creating greater, creating more jobs, uh, helping to alleviate poverty and reduce income inequality in the region. And uh, with regards to your second question, yes, uh, quality governance is indeed in, uh, important, especially with regards to um, improving investor confidence, uh, especially with regards to the, to the Belt and Road Initiative. Let me just complement what just Pauline mentioned, that also um, what it could be done in the countries that are participating in this initiative is to reduce the bureaucratic uh, procedures uh, and to adopt a, a common standards between countries. Uh, this will clearly facilitate um, a further increase uh, in the bilateral trade flows between countries and as a result improve the positive uh, consequences from this initiative. Matthew? Sure, I'm Matthew Lee, uh, in, Inner City Press. Uh, thanks for the briefing. A couple of questions. Uh, one is, is I wanted to ask, I'd, I know that there's been some coverage of the report about uh, demonetization and, and, and quote unquote, you know, either black money in India. And I'd like you to sit, just explain a bit more what the recommendations of the report would be to India. Also, there's, a, there's some dispute there about uh, merger of public sector banks. There's some unions saying that it would adversely, in fact, impact, impact not only their, their, you know, their members, but the economy. So I wanted to know, does, this, does this, this report or ESCAP have any view of this big picture item of whether public sector banks should be merged by India? And then what, what actually got me r racing in here from elsewhere was a line where I, th I believe you were saying that countries with less corruption tend to spend more on health and less on defense. And I just wonder, are you saying there's some kind of a correlation? Like, I guess one thing would say, would, you know, countries may choose their defense, defense expenditures based on perceived threats from outside. But are you say, do you somehow control for that to say that there's a link between less corruption and, 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 and these two things, or, or, or are there other factors involved? Thanks a lot. Um, so with respect to the demonetization, uh, the demonetization that was implemented last, uh, last December creates um, a liquidity crunch in the Indian economy that was important. It was mostly felt uh, in January and February, um, and especially in that sectors that relies a lot in cash, like restaurant, retail, restaurants. Um, and, uh, however, the recent hard data that was released in India show that um, this didn't have um, as a significant impact as, it were, as they were expected. Um, however, I would say that we need to be cautious about that because there's a lot of informality also in the Indian economy. So um, that, is issue, that is an issue to take into account. And also that um, uh, the GDP uh, growth numbers in the future can be uh, downgraded and can be adjusted. Uh, in terms of the mitigation measures, uh, I think um, the country is implementing some financial relief to, to the agricultural sector that is important, and also some credit support to a small, um, a small uh, businesses. Uh, I think this is, uh, is playing an important role to alleviate the liquidity crunch, and this should be move, move ahead. Um, in terms of what you mentioned uh, about the merger, uh, the merge of uh, the public banks, I think uh, the report does, does not really tackle uh, that specific issue. Uh, we have observed that uh, bad loans uh, has increased in, 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 in some public banks. 
Uh, however, um, that of course is not uh, is, is is part of the of the cycle of the trend. And uh, as as I also mentioned to your colleague, if you, uh, I would be happy to put you in contact with colleague uh, with the colleagues in XCAP in case you you want a, f a comprehensive um, a comprehensive answer to that to that question. Thank you. This is, uh, I think they did a study, ESCAP did a study uh, on the Asia-Pacific countries. I mean, with regards to the, the, the way, the methodology of it, um, perhaps we could also refer you to ESCAP colleagues as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? In that case, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.